This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Please join with me as we call ourselves to worship on this morning. Praise the God of all creation. Worship the one who calls us, speaking with a different voice, offering an unexpected invitation. Celebrate the presence of our loving God. Rejoice, the realm of God is near. Let us now join together singing our opening hymn of this morning's service, hymn number 281, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. Please stand if you are able to do so. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Father, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us now turn to God in prayer. Almighty God, we pray for your blessing on the church in this place. Here may the faithful find salvation and the careless be awakened. Here may the doubting find faith and the anxious be encouraged. Here may the tempted find help and the sorrowful find comfort. Here may the weary find rest and the strong be renewed. Here may the aged find consolation and the young be inspired. This we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord, the one who taught us as his disciples to pray saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Before you're seated, take just a moment or two to exchange words of greeting with those seated around you on this day.
to Buford Presbyterian Church. We are so glad to have all of you here with us this morning. And if you are visiting with us, we extend you a special welcome. We do hope that this is a warm and welcoming congregation and that you find that you truly do experience God's presence in your midst as we worship together this day. You have your bulletins, and there are a number of announcements and things taking place in the life of our congregation. Inside those, I invite you to read through those when you get a chance. Um, I am going to call a few of those to your attention, but before that, if you have not already, go ahead and pass your Ritual of Friendship pads uh, down your pews and back to the center. Uh, you signing in gives us an opportunity to know that you're here today. Um, also gives you a chance to get to know the names of those sitting on your pew and your row if you don't already know them. So we invite you to go ahead and do that at this time. A few announcements to call to your attention. There will be youth group tonight. Uh, do bring a coat if you're coming. I'm hoping that we're going to uh, play a couple games outside, so dress a little warmly tonight, but we will have youth group um, from 6.30 to 8.30 tonight. You'll also see that um, deposits for our mission trip are due today, so if you have any questions about that, um, need another week or so, please see me um, and let me know if you have any questions about the mission trip. Our welcome class started this morning, led by Dave Forder. Uh, that will run uh, this, started this morning um, during Sunday school, but will also be taking place next Sunday, January the 28th, as well as February the 4th. Um, that takes place in our parlor, just out here and around the corner, um, and is a great time if you're looking to learn more about what it means to be Presbyterian, what it means to be a member of this congregation. We invite you to attend that class want to highlight for you and commend to your reading, if you did not have a chance to take a look at our January newsletter, I want to encourage you to find a copy of that. There are copies in the narthex. There's also probably an email that you got with a link to it. Um, but we have a new article in our newsletter called One Church, One Family. Um, and each month we'll be highlighting um, families, members of our congregation, and there'll be a special write-up um, about different folks. So I want to encourage you to uh, read that and to learn more. Um, it's one more way that we're going to try and learn more about each other um, and the people that worship on the pews next to us. So I want to commend that to your reading um, and be looking for that in February. Um, next Sunday, uh, January the 28th, between the two worship services, we will have a congregational meeting. Uh, that meeting will begin at 1015. So if you happen to come to the 830 service next week, plan to stay a little bit longer um, for that congregational meeting. If you're regularly here at 11, I want to invite you to be here a little bit early at 1015. We'll meet here at this, in the sanctuary, um, but it's our annual congregational meeting. We'll be hearing um, reports from some of our committees, um, a step up to the well report and a few other things. We invite you to come and to be a part of that special meeting. Let's see. I think those are all. One other announcement there. Uh, you will see on the table outside, but the Tired Mothers Retreat is coming up. That will be March the 2nd through the 4th in Montreat. Um, and so you can find sign-up information um, and checks for that are due February the 18th. Those are all of the announcements that I have. Are there other announcements that folks have this morning? Let us continue to worship God. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive us all of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Knowing this, let us confess our sins first together in unison prayer and then in a moment of silent personal confession. Please join with me. Gracious God, when we fail to respond to your call with faith, forgive us. When we are shackled by our narrow understandings of discipleship and our clouded sense of purpose, forgive us. When we are frightened the future or pull back from the demand of your calling, forgive us. Help us, O oh God, to be your disciples in this world. Help us to answer the call to be your hands, your feet, and your voice for those in need. Help us to proclaim your peace, your comfort, 
your forgiveness, healing, love, and grace. And when we forget or fall short, forgive us. Open our ears, our minds, and our hearts. Call us again and use us for your glory. In the name of your Son, we pray. Amen. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us, even now. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone, and a new life has begun. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel, that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Amen. seated. At this time I would like to call for the children of the church for this morning's children's sermon led by Jennifer Marietta. Good morning. Am I on? Can you hear me? Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all this morning. How you doing? Did you have a little bit of a different week this week with school? I don't think we've had a full week of school since before Christmas. So be ready, because this week you're going to get tired, because we have five full days back. Well, it's good to see you all this morning. I want to go fishing. Has anyone here ever gone fishing? Raise your hand if you've gone fishing, yeah? Can you tell me, what are some of the things I need to go fishing? Yes. A fishing pole. I don't think I have one of those with me this morning. What else? What else could I use to go fishing if I don't have a fishing pole? Yes. Bait. Bait is important, right? You need, you need food for the fish to want to bite the hook. Okay. What else? Any ideas? A fishing pole, bait, maybe... You could what? You could make a fishing pole, right, with a stick. If you don't have it, you can make it with a stick and some line. A grabber. A grabber, something to grab it with. You could try your hands, but that might be tough. Yes, Lydia? A fish net, maybe a net. I'm feeling a little bit empty on all of those items, right? A bucket, a boat, a boat could help, right? Unless you want to walk out in the water to do it. I don't have any of that with me today. Could put a little fish on it. Well, you know, today, Pastor Carey is telling a story about Jesus, and he says to the disciples, I will make you, I will teach you how to fish for people if you follow me. And just like fishing, you need equipment, you also need equipment to follow Jesus. What are some things, if you wanted to follow Jesus, what are some things you might need or some things that could help us follow him? follow his rules. Where could I find some of Jesus' rules? Nice. Liddy Kate? On the mountain with the stones, right? Moses has the Ten Commandments, right? Those are some rules. 
Can, do I have stones to go look at, though? Where could I find where those commandments are written down? The what? The Bible. Guess what? I have one of those. I have one of those with me. Are those your favorite books? The Bible has a lot of really good information. I think this is a really good piece of equipment for us to use if we want to follow Jesus. Something else is the church, right? Coming to church each week, your families, you sit in church with your families and everybody else around us in the church is our family. They're our church family. And those are all things that remind us and help us know how to follow Jesus, right? By loving others and uh, thinking of others and wanting to tell others about Jesus Christ's love for us. So let's go ahead and bow our heads this morning and let's say a word of prayer. Please repeat after me if you're able, okay? Let us pray. Dear God, help us to love you and to follow Jesus Christ with all our heart, soul, and mind. Amen. All right, thank you all so much. You all have a wonderful week, and try to keep up that energy. <laughs>
those dealing with uh, the effects of, of old age and all that can come with it. We pray for those dealing with the flu, aware of how many people across all age groups are experiencing the flu at this time in our country, and we pray that uh, you would uh, make treatments available for those who need it the most. Lord, we pray also for those who are grieving the loss of a friend or a loved one. Help those who are grieving to find resources of comfort and always to find hope as they abide in your presence and trust in the promise of everlasting life. Lord of the Church, be a means of encouragement to those who are recent members of this church or other churches and to those who are contemplating membership, perhaps looking for a church home. We pray that you would always help newcomers to find places to serve and to have fellowship, that they might be engrafted to the body of Christ here. Lord, there are many things on our hearts and in our minds on this day. We know of many concerns that we have for individuals, for our country, for different people that we know, and we lift all of those to your care as we pray in the righteous name of Jesus Christ, the one who is with us today and every day by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Our first scripture reading on this morning is from the book of Jonah, the third chapter in which we find God coming to Jonah a second time after Jonah's reluctance to serve the first time he was called. Jonah chapter 3. Hear the word of God. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city going a day's walk. And he cried out, Forty days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. The people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast. And everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, no human being or animal, no herd or flock shall taste anything. They shall not feed, nor shall they drink water. Human beings and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, and they shall cry mightily to God. All shall turn from their evil ways, from their violence, and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us now join together in singing our second hymn of this morning's service, hymn number 377, Lord, You Have Come to the Lake Shore.
You may be seated. Our second scripture reading this morning, which perhaps is at least one of the gospel accounts that inspired the hymn we just sang together, is from Mark's gospel, chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. I invite you to listen now for God's word speaking to us this day. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee and his brother John, who were in their boat mending their nets. Immediately he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord stands forever. Time, we say, is of the essence. Time flies, usually when we're having fun. Time is money. Every now and then it's time for a change. There's never enough time, and we're grateful when things happen just in the nick of time, but only if we could turn back the hands of time. Only time will tell. There is perhaps one thing that most of us can agree on. Time is precious. Don't blink, they say. It's something I've heard more times in the last two years. We spend much of our lives making time, carving out time. We budget how we will spend our time. Inevitably, we waste time. It's something we simply don't have enough of. Since the beginning of time, I think, and certainly in the modern era, humanity has done everything in its power to try and harness time. When Thomas Edison invented the light bulb, it allowed people to stay up longer into the night. And now we expect, don't even think twice, about being able to work or to play when it's pitch black outside. The darkness no longer limits us. So to consider many of our modern advances, computers, the internet, our cell phones, all created supposedly to give us more time. In Mark's gospel, the time has come. Time is central to Mark's gospel and the story that he's telling. The time has come and the time is now. Although it is the second gospel in the New Testament, Mark actually was the first of the four gospels written and served as a literary model of sorts for the others. Matthew and Luke added their respective parables and extended the teachings on to Mark's more streamlined account. As commentators have frequently noted, Mark's gospel is a gospel of action. While Luke often uses the phrase, in those days, to signal a change in scene, and Matthew, the phrase, when Jesus finished saying these things, for Mark, the key word throughout his account is immediately. The word is used well over 40 times in the entirety of Mark's gospel. By the end of our reading this morning, only verse 20 of the first chapter, it's already been used three times 
twice in the passage that you heard this morning. Things happen fast in his tale, and if you blink, you might miss a crucial detail. As Ted Smith notes, Mark begins like an alarm clock, persistently declaring the time and demanding some sort of response. As Jesus walked along the Sea of Galilee that day, he sees Simon and Andrew, James and John, four men, normal, hard-working, everyday people minding their own business, tending to the day-to-day -day responsibilities of work and family. When Jesus encounters those four fishermen, he finds them, like us, working hard, earning a living, fulfilling their family obligations. And like some of us, perhaps he also finds them struggling to hold it together, looking forward with worry, looking back with regret. There are bills and taxes to be paid. For the sons of Zebedee, there is a father who relies on them. For Simon, Peter will find out in the next few verses, there is a mother-in-law with health concerns. And what comes next in this story has always been a bit of a stumbling block for me. Follow me, Jesus says, and immediately they drop their nets. Immediately he called them and they left. Immediately. Now don't get me wrong, I am certain that Jesus had a charismatic presence but even still, it seems highly unlikely to me that he is some kind of stranger or street evangelist that they have never met. Galilee is a rural area with a small town feel after all, and word travels quickly. These are God-fearing Jewish boys, and surely they have been to the temple and have heard him teach before about the kingdom of God. Surely he is one with whom they've broken bread and shared a meal and in doing so may have heard Jesus talk about this good news before. Surely they have had some time to think all of this through, to ponder the deeper meanings, to consider the pros and the cons, and then carefully map their way and their plan forward. For me, it is the only way that this story seems to make sense. Surely it wasn't quite immediately. I've often wondered if that's just me or just us or perhaps our time and place within history. It has been said that technology changes behavior and behavior shapes our attitude. I'll say that again. Technology changes our behavior, and our behavior shapes our attitude. With so much control afforded to us these days, I wonder about some of the same questions that Judith Watt poses when she asks, are we still able to open ourselves to God's timing? to God's surprising inbreakings into our lives, to God's calls. The tension between the control of our own lives and turning ourselves over to God's will for us has been a long-standing human problem. But has it become even more of a problem now, given our technological advances and the control we have or think we do, is it even harder than it once was to conceive of ourselves dropping everything and responding to Jesus immediately? Are we even more likely now to put off taking the call, to wait until we have enough time to suspect perhaps that the caller has nothing important to say to us, so why bother to dismiss the call? all together because we don't believe we'll be able to do what the caller is asking of us. 
Perhaps because of all of this, I am grateful for the witness of Jonah in Scripture. In the chapters leading up to the passage that Pastor Corey read for us this morning, Jonah certainly does not seem to be striving toward the model that any of his biblical ancestors may have set for him. As Reverend Dr. William Carl puts it, all over the Bible, people are getting up and going. Abraham and Sarah move out on a promise and a prayer. Moses heads for Egypt with nothing more than a shepherd's crook and Aaron to write his sermons for him. Elijah stands defiant facing 450 Baal prophets, but not Jonah. Jonah stands on the dock with his tickets for Tarshish and deliberately chooses to go in a direction opposite of the call of God. Even when Jonah does seemingly follow God's call, he does so only reluctantly, half-heartedly, repulsed by the people with whom he must share God's message. It is the shortest sermon in all of scripture, five words in the Hebrew, eight in English, 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Hardly something that would turn people's hearts and minds, but in the end, the people of Nineveh do the unthinkable, the impossible, at least in Jonah's mind. The people of Nineveh listened. They listened to Jonah, and they heard God's message despite the messenger. Jonah's story stands as a reminder that God's will cannot be circumvented or thwarted. Yet while God persists in faithfulness, God also interacts in ways unanticipated by the prophet and by us, expressing mercy where judgment has been promised. When it comes to those four men sitting on the side of the Sea of Galilee, Barbara Brown Taylor rightly suggests that we're missing the point if we, like I have, linger on our questions about how these men could have so instantly dropped everything and followed Jesus, or if we linger on our questions about whether we could do the same. She says, this story is a story about God not about the disciples or about us. To focus on what the disciples gave up and whether we could do the same is to put the accent on the wrong syllable. This miracle story, as she calls it, is really about the power of God to walk right up to a quartet of fishermen and work a miracle, creating faith where there was no faith, creating disciples where none were just a moment before. We have become so independent, seemingly so more in control of our lives and our time, that we may have lost something. We may have lost a sense of the fullness of the power of God, the power of God to recruit people who have made terrible choices, the power of God to invade the most hapless lives and fill them with light, the power of God to sneak up on people who are thinking about lunch and certainly not God and smack them upside the head with glory. Follow me and I will make you fish for people, Jesus said, and immediately they left their, net, their nets. Miracle, indeed. But not because of some superhuman courage or prophetic foreknowledge. In fact, these are the same men who later in the gospel will doubt, deny, and abandon Jesus. They're as fallible 
and as ordinary as the rest of us, and their own volition can't get them very far. Ultimately, they immediately follow Jesus because Jesus makes it possible for them to do so. Jesus would indeed teach them to cast a new kind of net, a net of love and compassion, a net of teaching and healing, a net of salvation over the people that they would meet. But it never would have happened if they hadn't left their fishing nets behind. For the, for the fishermen on the side of the Sea of Galilee, it was a call that was personal, a call that simply could not be ignored. Perhaps if we struggle to hear that call ourselves, it's because like many of us, myself included, we perhaps know absolutely nothing about fishing. But God's call to each of us is just as personal as it was for those fishermen. And I imagine that to the engineer or the contractor or the construction worker, Jesus just as easily could have said, follow me and build my people. To the artist, to the dancer, follow me and paint the colors of the kingdom. Follow me and dance with the spirit. To the teacher, the stay-at-home parent, follow me and nurture my children. To the nurse and the physician, follow me and heal broken souls. To all of us, Jesus says, follow me and I will make you. Dot, dot, dot. But what is it that you fill in that blank with? Follow me, Jesus says, and I will make you. This is a promise, a promise to cultivate us, not to sever us from what we love or those we love. It's a promise rooted in gentleness and respect not violence or coercion. It's a promise that when we dare to let go, the things we relinquish might be returned to us anew, alivened in ways which we couldn't have imagined on our own. And most importantly, it is a promise from God to us, certainly not the other way around. It is a helpful reminder, I think, when theologian William Barclay says, it all began for them with a personal reaction to Jesus. It all began in a tug on the heart. Jesus doesn't ask the fishermen to add one more task to their already busy lives. He calls them into new ways of being. He doesn't give them a new list of things to do, but instead a new identity and a whole new life. And that is why they turn in a moment and follow. A whole new life lived as best as possible in alignment with the will of God. Ultimately, following Jesus is the ongoing process of turning our lives in the same direction as God's life. And sometimes that means doing the same things we always do, but doing them in a new way or for new reasons. Following Jesus is to claim our identities as children of God and to live lives faithful to such a calling. Following Jesus is rededicating ourselves, in Martin Luther King Jr.'s words, to the long and bitter but beautiful struggle for a new world. Are you ready? The time has come. The time is now. May it be so. Amen. 
I invite you all now to stand as you are able and join me in professing our faith together using the excerpt from a brief statement of faith that's printed in your bulletin. Please stand. And let us say together what we believe. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick and binding up the brokenhearted, forgiving sinners and calling all to repent and believe the gospel unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. Amen. You may be seated. All that we have is a gift from God. In faith and in gratitude, we return now a portion of what we have so abundantly received as grateful heirs of the promises of God. Let us now give back to God.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we dedicate to you not only these gifts, but also ourselves in deep gratitude for your call upon our lives, your guidance in our baptismal journeys, and for blessing us that we may be a blessing to others. Accept what we bring to you now for your own good purposes. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Now let us join together in singing our final hymn of the morning, hymn number 343, called as Partners in Christ's Service. Jesus said, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they dropped their nets. Friends, as you follow Jesus out into the world this day, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you might abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Amen.